Hi, everyone. Welcome to the CSBI podcast. I'm Richard Hanania. I'm here with Eric Kaufman, uh, who's the author of a new report, Academic Freedom in Crisis, Punishment, Political Discrimination, and Self-Censorship, which you can find on the CSBI website today. Uh, Eric, how are you doing? Good, good. Glad to be here, Richard. Looking forward to it. Yeah, glad glad to have you. Uh, so um, introduce yourself just for most people, of course, I think will be familiar with who you are, but just a little introduction. Who are you? Who are you? Where where do you work? What do you do, et cetera? Yeah, so, um, well, I'm a professor of uh, political science at uh, uh, Birkbeck College, of, which is one of the University of London uh, colleges, and um, which, which actually does, tends to do evening master's degrees. Um, now, I've basically done a few things. I've written a book recently called White Shift, which is on populism in, in Western countries and, and where that whole uh, debate is going, a bit on polarization, which is uh, my most recent book with Penguin here in the UK and, and Abrams books in, in the US. Um, but mainly I'm a specialist uh, in questions of nationalism and ethnic uh, conflict and also uh, political demography, how population change affects politics. And most recently, I've started looking at questions around um, academic freedom uh, and the entire issue of what I call left modernism, other people call wokeness. It's something I've written about going right back to my PhD. So I'm all interested in the, in the interplay of these things. On the one hand, nas populist nationalism. On the other hand, um, the kind of cultural left or left modernism. And then on the third hand, the sort of demographic shifts that are going on. Yeah, and you're 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 sort of a, a man whose time has come because I've been reading your books for a while, and uh, you had I mean you've always been interested in demogra uh, demography, nationalism, uh, the stuff that just drives our politics in a fundamental way, and maybe you know five, ten, I wouldn't say five, I'd say, you know, 10, 15 years ago, people weren't talking about it as much. Um, you know, you wrote a book, Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth? And and the, the religious stuff has sort, of, has sort of gone on the back burner. Uh, your argument there was basically exponential growth. And, you know, the right. religious people are having a lot more kids than the uh, secular people. And you could see this, I mean, you could see controversies in Israel, who's further along in this process than most Western nations. But I mean, every, everybody is going to get there. It's a sort of a, it's a natural selection, although you don't focus on the, uh, on the evolutionary uh, implications or aspects of that. But just, you know, you just do, you just do the math and the Amish will be the majority of America by what, what was it? 2200 or something like well, that? Well, not the majority, but there's going to be three, roughly 300 million if we go into the mid 2200s <laughs> at current rates um, yeah. <laughs> but, but but yeah the, the all the things i said in that book are even more true now than they were then you know yeah. in terms of secular birth rates have continued to go even lower the only you know groups with above replacement fertility are practicing religious groups i mean in the kind of modern western countries uh, Israel is kind of a slight exception right, to that. But, right. yeah. yeah. So that's another question. I think that'll be the question for next century. Yeah. More than this one. <laughs> and so that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, so that's one of your ideas. And the other one was, uh, you know, nationalism, which is more immediate, which people yeah. are, are thinking about today. Um, and then White Shift is just, you know, a great book that goes into, I, I think it just slays sort of the myths surrounding Trumpism and, uh, and nationalism, what's, what's driving these things. But, you know, we'll, we'll, pro we'll probably have to talk about those other books at some later date. Uh, for now, uh, we're, you know, we're going to talk about this new report. Um, it's about academic freedom. This is also a, a timely subject. So you're, you're, you're hopping onto the right bandwagon again. Um, <laughs> I like bandwagons, Richard. <laughs> yeah, well, no, you're, 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 a, you're, a, you're a pioneer too. You were talking about nationals <laughs> before it was cool. So I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say you're, you're, you're jumping on bandwagons, but uh, you know, this is a pop, this is a popular topic. Now people are concerned about it. And I, when you look at the news, people are concerned about a lot of things. I mean, there's, it doesn't mean that there's always data to support it. People think, uh, you know, people, a viral video uh, will get people's attention and they'll say there's a trend. And then sometimes you look at the underlying statistics of what they're talking about and there really isn't much there. Uh, and so this is you, this study that you've done for CSPI is really, really comprehensive. Can you talk just a little bit about uh, the need for it and what's it, what's it trying to prove? Yeah. So, so really this is bringing together uh, two major things. I mean, one, there is already a small literature on political discrimination. Uh, we now know, just generally say, if you take the U.S. case, that people are far more likely to discriminate on whether you're a Democrat or a Republican um, than they are on, say, race, for example, uh, or gender. 
Um, there, it's a much more acceptable thing to just discriminate against a Republican or, or against a Democrat. Um, now, that's sort of a general social phenomenon. Uh, but then if you move into a, an institution where there's a very pronounced ideological skew, you know, if you had an institution where it was 50% Republicans and 50% Democrats and they each discriminated against each other, which is pretty much what happens, then, you know, it kind of comes out in the wash. You, you get some people against you, some in favor. When you have a sort of 10 or 15 to 1 ratio like you do in social sciences and humanities academia, uh, then you're going to have... Um, a huge discriminatory effect. Uh, and, and this is what a lot of pre-existing work by the likes of, uh, you know, to some extent, Lee Jassim with his recent paper with, with Honeycutt and, and uh, Inbar and Lammers in 2012. And a number of these papers have found that, lo and behold, you know, around, around about somewhere between 20% and a half of academics would discriminate against a conservative grant application or paper. Um, so I've taken that approach, but just expanded it to, to a number of surveys. So I've conducted eight surveys in total uh, with various methods. Some are the gold-plated YouGov uh, survey in the case of, of Britain, that's hugely expensive. Um, but we've also got some that are um, online surveys that have been sent to US and Canadian academics. We've got some from online platforms like Prolific Academic, where uh, we can say with confidence that we got you know between 70 and, and 85% of the available pool of people on there. So it's unlikely to be self-selection. Um, and so with these surveys, we're really able to show that survey after survey after survey is showing exactly the same results. Not exactly, but pretty close. Um, and so political discrimination, that comes out very cleanly. So a couple of sort of headline findings, if you like. 40% um, of American academics would discriminate against a known Trump supporter. Now, this is pre-Capitol riot. This is kind of August, summertime, four in 10. And 45% of my compatriots, Canadian academics, said they would discriminate against a Trump supporter. This is not just a US phenomenon. Um, Britain, it's, it's one in three would discriminate against a Brexit supporter. Uh, and, and bear in mind that 52% of the British population voted for Brexit. So that's telling you how, how much of a bubble we're, we're talking about here. Um, so that's sort of the political discrimination angle. In addition, this is quite new, is I'm, I've looked at this sort of cancel culture. How willing are academics to endorse campaigns to fire their colleagues for politically incorrect views on particularly race and gender type topics? Uh, and, and actually, there the news is pretty positive in, in one sense, in that very few uh, academics, only about one in 10, will tend to support one of those cancel campaigns uh, at any given moment. So the, the, the support base for canceling is actually pretty slim within the professoriate. But there is some news which is less good, which we can come on to in a minute. Yeah, and so it's you do this. Um, you make this. Uh, uh, this uh, you distinguish between hard authoritarianism and soft authoritarianism. So hard authoritarianism is the basically the videos. It's the stuff we see. Um, or it's somebody uh, uh, not being allowed to speak. Someone you know, maybe being disciplined by the uh, by their department. And then there's soft authoritarianism. This is stuff that uh, the left tends to be very sensitive to in other contexts. So you know microaggressions. Uh, you know subconscious conscious discrimination. They're always thinking that this is a big deal. And even if when they can't find the hard kind of authoritarianism for the kinds of discrimination they're interested in, um, they, they assure us that the soft discrimination is, is important and it's, it's there. Uh, so the, the hard discrimination, I mean, you don't find that most people uh, want to cancel. So, what, what do you ask about specifically? You ask about um, just go into the go, to, go into the studies because you ask the, the format. Yeah. If your colleague found this, would you favor firing them? Right. Right. So, so there's kind of like two faces to this. One is the victims, and we want to survey their experiences of of being victimized, and then also the perpetrator, which is would you dismiss? Would you endorse a firing campaign? So, on the perpetrator side, we have, you know, this question I just mentioned about, I lay out five scenarios um, asking, uh, okay, here's an academic that comes up with a finding that uh, organizations with more women and minorities perform less effectively. Um, should the university try and um, essentially force this person out? Right. Um, another question might be someone who finds that um, 
children in two parent families do better than children in single parent families or that the British empire did more good than harm. These are just scenarios that, and, and then I have one which is relatively benign, which is just somebody who thinks immigration should be reduced. Um, now what you see is, is across the, the five scenarios, you know, in roughly one in 10 uh, academics would support uh, such an individual being forced out for that for their views. So the, the, the support base is really only about 10%, even though yes, what you, you know, if you take it, you know, any one of these five uh, scenarios, if that counts as cancellation, then it's it's 25% of academics would support at least one of those firing campaigns, but only a, a few percent would support all of them. So I'm going with about one in 10, which isn't too bad a number. Um, however, if we then go on to the victimization side, um, one of the things that we see is about one in three um, graduate students and um, academics in the United States has either been disciplined or threatened uh, with discipline. So both of those are count for, for what I would call hard authoritarianism. So both discipline, being disciplined or being threatened with discipline represent forms of, of direct threats to academic freedom that come out of the disciplinary apparatus of the university. I would go further in terms of hard authoritarianism and say something like being shunned by your colleagues or, or being pressured or bullied by your colleagues is also, I would classify that as a form of uh, hard authoritarianism, which I think is distinctive from, let us say, simply being somewhat discriminated against for a position in the department. Yeah, on the cancellation thing, I mean, you um, you find that most are not for cancellation, most are not against it, most, uh, not even most, but plurality uh, take a um, uh, sort of more uh, ambiguous view. And these questions you ask, actually, I think you could have got the cancellation numbers much higher if you were maybe a little bit more controversial in the findings. Traditional parenthood, two, two family homes, I, I don't know if that's the most controversial question in academia. So when you, you really touch on the sacred of race and gender, um, minorities and women lower performance, right? Uh, so you get you get something like 20% want to fire that person. Uh, it's right. close to that. And then in young academics, uh, US and Canadian PhDs, 43%. That's a recurring theme of your of your, uh, of your your findings too. It's that the uh, PhD students, the next generation is more, um, more in favor of authoritarianism yeah. than the younger. And then 30% of UK PhD. So that's one third. So that's the question that riled people up the most. Uh, if right. you asked about, say, something like uh, race and intelligence, or perhaps uh, women should not have um, same opportunities to jobs because they, they are better uh, off, you know, as wives and mothers. I think those numbers would go through the roof. You would probably find a majority. You would. Cancellation. Yeah, you might. You would find higher a higher share. I was trying to go for cases I thought might, well, they were modeled on cases that either had occurred or might occur, you know, but you're right. If I asked about some, say a race IQ, you know, somebody doing that research, I probably would have got a higher share. That would be an interesting follow on question. The, the other thing, of course, is the more concrete. Uh, that's what I would like to do next time is maybe ask about a concrete case, try and find the most controversial case I could and see what the support base is. But part of this is I'm more kind of interested not so much in the really extreme stuff, but in the stuff that's likely to crop up, let's say. Yeah. Um, somebody thinks immigration is bad for the US, you know, something like that, um, and wants to make that argument. You know, how much would they be willing to cancel such an individual? Um, and, and yeah, so you had about a one in 10 across these questions, but what is interesting, as you just mentioned, is, you know, academics under age 35, twice as likely as those age, 50 and over to favor cancellation. Um, and so the number for those under 35, I think is about 0.38 chance, 38% chance that they would say yes to at least one of those five cancellation scenarios. Whereas for 50 and above, it's sort of around 0.15 or something. Uh, PhDs are even more pro cancel in the US, 0.56 chance uh, of supporting at least one of those five scenarios. So what that picture is painting is on the one hand, good news that it's really a relatively slender support base now, but it's also indicating that amongst the youngest academics, uh, there is a much greater um, propensity to support cancellation. And in fact, a stat which um, also another stat in the report, I believe, is the uh, social justice versus academic freedom question. And if you look in the US, 
amongst academics under age 30 and under, it's roughly 50-50 between whether they prioritize free uh, academic freedom and uh, social justice, whereas for the 50 plus, it's three to one academic freedom to social justice. I think that's telling us, and, and there've been some studies of student opinion that have shown it to become more intolerant over time. So it is indicating, I think, that the threat to academic freedom is going to increase and not decrease in the come in the years ahead. And I would also add that even in models where we control for whether you're left wing or right, far left versus far right, you know, that ideology, even when you control for that, age is hugely significant. Young far leftists much more intolerant than old far leftists. Yeah. Um, so this is one of the reasons I think that we are headed for more trouble. Yeah, I mean, people talk about, you know, boomers, it's sort of the most uh, fashionable thing in the world to attack them, but a far left <laughs> boomer is much more likely to be tolerant of your uh, free speech rights than a, than a far left uh, millennial. I mean, I think that's that's absolutely clear in the in the data. So, yeah, this is all, yeah, this is all <laughs> getting worse. It's going in the wrong direction, obviously. Uh, you know, I should mention um, this, this report is uh, close to 200 pages. So there's there's stuff in there that we're not going to be able to get to in this conversation or multiple conversations. And so I encourage people to read the report or at least look at, look at the figures. Uh, there's, there's a lot of figures, basically every finding is visualized <laughs> in some way. Uh, we have an executive summary, which is about 15 pages for people who just want, uh, um, you, you know, the top line results, but there's so much in there. That's, that's interesting age, gender differences, ethnic differences within uh, academia. And it's just, it's just going to be a rich resources. I think a resource, I think for very, uh, for very long to come. Um, one thing. So, so yeah, let's go back a little bit. I mean, the there's a there's a, there's been studies before that sample academics, and I think this is is this the first one to have a really because good sample of um, conservatives? Because if conservatives are you know one in ten or one in twenty of acad, uh, of um, academics, usually if you go out and you get a sample um, of whatever you know five hundred or whatever, you're not going to have that many conservatives, especially in the social science humanities, it might be like one in fifty, right? So if you get a sample of five hundred, you have you have uh, ten. Um, you have a fit. You have a you have fifty. You have a yeah, just fifty. Yeah, you have you have you have one in fifty. You have ten. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so um, what we did is what or what you did is you went to the National Association of Scholars. So t- tell us about that. How you were able to really just focus in on these conservatives. So you got from their perspective too. Yeah. So I tried to do a number of approaches. One of the things I did was go to the National Association of Scholars, and I we got about ten percent of their members uh, to fill out a survey with questions that I could. Matt, you know, just to explain who the National Association of Scholars are. Oh, yeah. National Association of Scholars is sort of a, an association that's concerned with defending academic freedom. Uh, they do really good work. Um, they help out, out their members. Uh, they are, you know, unusually in academia, they're a more right-leaning uh, organization. And, and the membership surveys showed that, that uh, I think roughly 60% were Republican. Um, and they, I think only, maybe it was... 10 or 15% on the left, and then uh, the rest centrist. So it's very unusual in academia. Um, But it really helped to bolster the sample. Now, of course, there are all, you know, you could always say, well, it's going to be a self-selecting group to some degree. And so I'm, but I'm using that survey partly to bolster the sample of conservatives. And so that's about 230 uh, conservatives. Whereas in the main academic surveys, you know, in the U.S. survey, for example, out of 800, I think I got about 43 conservatives. And in the Ph.D. surveys, I got a similar number, uh, which is useful and is a different sample to compare with. But it helps just to triangulate these different samples to, to particularly questions like, do you feel you can express your views to colleagues? It's just nice to have a, a larger sample to compare with. Um, but more than in, in, if you take the just academically, what is distinctive about some of the work that's been done. Uh, the first thing is, you know, the YouGov British sample is drawn from a major survey company. And we've got about anywhere we calculate between 61 and 76% of the uh, people on the YouGov path who happen to be academics or retired academics. So we're getting an accidental sample that's not self-selected with a up to 75% response rate. All of the previous surveys of this type have not, none of them have had above a 25% response. So this is just now on the US and Canadian uh, academic surveys, we've got a single digit percent response, but that's not a problem necessarily in the sense that 
um, the responses are all lining up very similarly with many different methodologies. And, and that's just partly what this is about is having a different range of samples. The other thing too, that's pretty distinctive is the hard, hard authoritarianism cancel culture side. That's not been asked uh, really before in any serious way. This setup allowed, we have quite a few questions on uh, support for dismissal, uh, feelings of being threatened with discipline. Those are all new and we're able to kind of show also that there's a relationship between somebody who's willing to discriminate against a conservative and somebody who's willing to dismiss uh, controversial scholars. There is a significant relationship there. Yeah, so I mean, this is this is exactly, this is ideally what you want in science. You wanna replicate results with different methodologies and you wanna uh, look at it from different perspectives. So you go to mainstream academics and you say, do you discriminate in this scenario or that scenario? Or do you, uh, you know, what, are you li likely to give a person a term paper, a lower, uh, uh, <coughs> lower grade for a term paper because that person is conservative, all these questions. And then you find, uh, you find uh, a large enough sample of conservatives to ask from their perspective, from the perpetrator, for the, from the victim's perspective, right? What have you, what have you felt in your, in your time in academia? And um, it's, you know, some of these numbers are just from the taking the conservative perspective is amazing. So threatened by disciplinary action for speech, 23%. Um, of the uh, National Association for Scholars, uh, so right? I mean, this is this is hard. This is hard authoritarianism, right? This is this is uh, threatening you. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. One in one in four. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, reported bullying for beliefs, thirty six percent. I mean, bullying. I don't know how you define that, but thirty six percent feel that way. Um, you know, un 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 uncomfortable expressing beliefs, fifty seven percent in the UK. Um, social science and humanities, uh, admitting to self censoring in the US, seventy percent. Um, Pro-Trump academics who saying Trump, you know, they would not express Trump supporter would not express their view. Ninety-one percent, right? So these are these are numbers that are that are uh, off the charts. That it's really, I mean, incredible. And it's not just, um, you know, we talked a little earlier about the the really controversial stuff. It's it's not just conservatives or Trump supporters. There's a uh, there's a lot on gender critical feminists. Uh, uh, in this, so gender critical feminists are women who do not accept the idea uh, that tr uh, no, not women, but you know, feminists. Anyone who doesn't accept the idea that trans women should have access to all female spaces. Um, and this seems, I don't, I mean, I don't know how big this seems like a big deal in in Britain. I mean, I think you mentioned in the report at one point that uh, a large portion of non-conservatives who mention uh, people who consider themselves leftists who. Um, uh, who are felt discrimination in some way or some kind of uh, uh, self censorship? It was because of this issue, right? It was because of this, yeah. right? So can you uh, talk well, about ten percent of the uh, it, was the it was the main the largest stated reason. About ten percent of the left wing respondents who who talked about self censoring, um, this was one of the main reasons. And it's interesting. A study in Britain recently showed that the group most likely to be no platformed uh, were the gender critical feminists. So, uh, and, and it's amazing, really. Some of them have got to walk around with bodyguard. It, it is really staggering. And it's, it can be hard to understand, right, for, for, for people who aren't in that debate. Uh, but the trans kind of, it's not trans people necessarily themselves, but people who've taken on this issue as a sort of symbolic one for their movement. Uh, that that version of kind of the, the radical leftist, but that trans lobby, um, they're just super organized. They mobilize people very effectively, and they they really it's no holds barred against these poor gender critical feminists. And and you know it's it's really quite amazing. Are you implying these trans women who transition into women might be a little bit more aggressive than the feminists, the cisgendered feminists? No, no. <laughs> no, no. I mean, most of these people are trans. Even I think it is a—it's just a major political uh, cause celebre, I guess, is what it is. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think there's—I think there's something. I mean, I think there's something else. Uh, I think there's something else going on there. But I think I think we could put that to the side. I think when you have uh, this category of women, and what one might have a average higher testosterone than this other group of women, the group with the higher testosterone, especially if they get to call themselves women, um, and they they consider they're considered women by society, I think they're I think they're going to win that debate. But that's a that's a different issue. Right, right, different issue. Yeah. Um, but um, anyhow, the this is just to say then that some of the reports of people at the sharp end of these processes show that this is not just a few no platform is, I mean, this is part of the, um, it, it's just part of the point is that 
I mean, even if we don't even just look at the right, I mean, one of the, this, this UCU study, which is a, a left-wing union that's, that studied opinion in Britain amongst academics and showed that, you know, 11% of all academics, which are just overwhelmingly left uh, leaning had experienced uh, either discipline or threats of discipline for their view, academic views. So even though it is um, higher, it is considerably higher amongst conservative academics. It is even an issue amongst 10% right. of, of left-leaning academics. But this is just to show that this hard authoritarianism, it could be coming from your department head. It's not necessarily coming from your university. Um, it is very much a factor and it and it hits harder for those with dissenting views uh, such as conservative. Do you think academics are just very sensitive? I mean, are, are they just a usually sensitive group of people who consider bullying and pressure, uh, their definition of what that is, is different from say other people? I mean, there's no doubt some of that, but I think as we saw in the perpetrator question around, would you support dismissal? Um, you know, you're getting one in 10 yeah. academics willing to support that. You're getting one in four willing to support at least one of those five campaigns. So it's not as though there is no support for hard authoritarianism. And the other thing is too, on one of the questions um, where we asked about, you know, do you support uh, race and gender quotas on reading lists? And then the next the follow-up question was, well, okay, let's say someone refuses to comply and change their reading list. What measures do you endorse uh, from firing to take, you know, taking away their course to making them do diversity training? And you could see there wasn't a lot of support for the really hard measures like firing or uh, stripping them of their course. Although the young one, the young academics were somewhat more likely to support that, but it's, it's, but there was a lot of support for, for example, making them take uh, extra bias awareness training, you know, things which are also a violation of freedom of conscience issues. Um, so, you know, there is some support on the perpetrator side for the hard authoritarianism. And it's not entirely an imagined quantity. Yeah, I think that's unquestionably true. And you do have, um, you do have da you do have uh, sort of figures from other professions, which is another interesting uh, part of the the survey. Um, you know, here's something that you know I wonder. So we talk about uh, climate, and we talk about um, how m most academics think. Uh, so when I was um, when I was say in grad school or even undergrad, taking a class or teaching a class, it was it, I never felt like the mood of the class was determined by you know the average student who, who was just sort of sitting there and you know just just taking it in and going with the flow. I always felt that there was, often there would be a, you know, two or three um, in like class discussions who would just enforce some orthodoxy, um, who would really go out of their way to say, oh my goodness, you, you, you can't, you can't say that. I remember it was once I was, uh, uh, I was in a uh, graduate student course and we were talking about uh, political psychology and like theories of democracy and the voter understands. I said, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe there's some issues that the cognitive capabilities of the voter, you know, cannot understand. Maybe it's just, you know, it's just people have cognitive limits. And, this, uh, and there was a girl who just said, you know, that, 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 that's very offensive. And I said, you know, that's not an argument. And there was always... <laughs> <laughs> there was always these like there was always these just these few and they would change the entire um uh you know tone of the conversation so are, are we maybe missing the point a little bit when we're looking at um we're looking at just averages you know what what would most people think shouldn't we be focusing on um uh sort of the most active minority yeah that's an interesting question like i think from a kind of complex system a sort of you know, dynamic where you get these sort of first dominoes and, and, and once they move, everyone else kind of herds. Um, I think there, there is that that goes on. And, and that's not something that's so easy to get at with this data. So, I, I mean, I sort of try to get at it a little bit looking at something called preference falsification, which is whether people actually support academic freedom, but have to signal that they support uh, social justice instead. Um, and I didn't see a ton of evidence for that. So a lot of people, for example, who, let's say, would oppose a firing campaign against a controversial professor, we asked, you know, to what extent would you be willing to, to say that publicly or would you just think it privately? And, you know, I would say there was a slight edge amongst the people who opposed these firing campaigns. There was a slight majority who said they would publicly be willing to say it. Now, of course, whether they would actually be willing to say it is, is another thing. But um, 
it does suggest to me that it, it didn't look like a profile of, of academia where it was everybody believing one thing, but they're scared into silence. I, I'm, I'm, not saying, yeah. I'm not saying exactly everyone believes the same thing. I, I'm, yeah. I'm saying that it's sort of, most people just don't care either, either way. They're sort of, they're just sort of focused on themselves. And, you know, they'll answer a survey question. You can get whatever results and then you can use whatever methods to get around uh, preference falsification. Uh, but in the end, when you get to the, um, when you actually get to academia, um, you have maybe 5% that are just, just driving the car. And everyone else is, um, and if they, if, if look, if they had complete opposition, I mean, because you, you find a plurality are not unambiguously for academic freedom, they're not am, unambiguously against it, right? Um, yes, that's, that's, that's the plurality. That's right. So, and even some who say they would say so, who knows if they'd say something or how much they would say or you, you know whatever. Um, and so, yeah. you know, is is this could this be an issue of? Um, I guess I guess not because you have the data and they do say we discriminate, right? So, so I guess you have that. Yeah, so yeah. If, you, if you have a, committee. I think I actually, if you want to, you know, my true belief on this is that this is not so much a collective action problem. That's part of it, but that this is fundamentally about a conflict of values between mm -hmm. those who think speech is violence, emotional safety is important, more important than free speech, and those who think the free speech, academic freedom side is more important than um, essentially purported harm to very sensitive members of totemic protected groups, if, to put it in, in, in a certain religious language. And I do think that this, call it social justice, which is essentially about not hurting the feelings of groups that have been sacralized. Uh, I think that idea exists and people believe in it. And it bulks larger amongst younger uh, academics and PhDs. I actually think it is it is a real belief system, and I think it it is eclipses. For some people, it eclipses their belief in academic freedom and pursuing the truth. So I, I actually think it is a, a battle of ideas uh, more than it is about people scared. Yes, people scared matters, uh, no doubt about it. But I actually think if it was the case that everybody backed free speech over emotional safety. I don't think this thing would have gotten as far as it's gotten. Yeah, I mean, human motivations are complex and it's hard to, um, you know, it's hard to distinguish. So, um, you know, my one of my favorite thinkers ever is, is Robert Trivers, who who says that people convince themselves, um, people convince themselves of things that they need to convince themselves of when they have the incentive to convince themselves or something. So <laughs> right. Well, they have a, uh, you know, a belief in social justice. I mean, it's, it's like, it's like, um, yeah, they, I, I, I'm sure they do. Is that ultimate ultimately rooted in power structures? I, I sound like I sound like some kind of academic. I, I honestly, and this is, I mean, I'm generally not a a rat choice or cult or Marxist type. I mean, I tend to. I mean, maybe that's my bias. I'm I'm more kind of culturally biased, believer in culture as an independent variable. But I think if you you know, if you look at, say, I mean, the studies that have been done using voter registration and donation data, that's pretty comprehensive by Mitchell Langbert on. on no, no, no. You're still, you're still, you're, you're, they are genuinely giving to, you know, they are overwhelmingly Democrats, number one. I'm saying something yeah. more subtle. I'm, I'm not yeah. saying that they're lying or that they're hiding their beliefs. I'm yeah. saying that once you have a power structure, and you have this diversity industrial complex, and you have other people like the media, and you have um, you have the federal government with anti discrimination laws that sort of push this wokeness to a certain extent. People's internal beliefs will change on that basis. So yes, none of nothing you say is maybe there's no way to get maybe there's no way to get at you know this this difference. But but it is it is sort of important to just consider philosophically um, and just sociologically. Uh, so the and that would be consistent with everything you say. You know they would give money to Democrats. They would uh, answer poll questions at a certain way they would uh, sign on to an open letter campaign to cancel Steven Pinker or whoever they're going after this week and it's it, and it's all genuine to them I mean there's the I think that's the Trivers that's the Trivers um, uh, that's the insight it's that it becomes genuine but it's ultimately rooted in self-interest does that make sense yeah yeah I can I, I understand that point and I suppose you you could go back to the beginnings of this I mean I guess I'm sort of more Gramscian <laughs> you know, I, I think you can trace this thing from a small group of yeah. uh, radical left modernists yeah. in, the, in, in, well, even going back to the, the very beginnings, the 1910s, 
bohemian intellectuals, you know, and then in the 60s, you got this big expansion in the universities and, and the TV media. Um, they then enter the academy, uh, begin to change its composition. I think these are kind of true believers who at, at, at really are kind of a minority in society. And, you know, is, is it the case that as they conquer institution after institution and change the incentive structure, more people come over to their side? Well, yeah. Yeah. yes, probably there's some of that uh, self-reinforcing feedback going on. Um, but yeah, and then that's part of what that'll happen with any sort of ideological shift. You'll get the, the people who heard um, and, and, and maybe they'll come to believe this stuff for real, right? I, I, but I guess I guess the proof will be, you know, if any of these institutions was taken over by the other side, would, would these people then jump back uh, and convince themselves of the other side? I mean, I, it'll be interesting. I, I think there's something to it. Yeah, it might take a generational turnover or, or something, right? If, if the power structure changed, mm. people don't, maybe they don't switch. Although sometimes, sometimes they do. I mean, there are people who talk about after World War II, you know, uh, Germ Germans would <laughs> have one ideology one day. And then, especially something like Easter Ger East Germany, they would, have, they would become, they would become communists the next day. I mean, people can be malleable based on uh, um, who's in power and the yeah, people differ. And some people are true believers. They'll go to, you know, we'll have a genuine belief and we'll, um, you know, we'll, we'll fight for it and we'll die for it till the very end. And some people are more, uh, you know, they're going with the flow. Um, so yeah, this, it, it, these are, I mean, these are, these are interesting questions. I mean, the, um, the, uh, um, you, there was, there's a lot of testimonials in there. So uh, there, it, this, uh, this is mostly a data driven work. Um, but you have uh, testimonials and you divide them nicely, you divide them between like the North America and you have the UK and you have some from uh, leftists too. Um, and people who are interested can look at them in the reports. W what struck you? Did anything surprise you about, about uh, what you saw there? Yeah, it's interesting. The testimonial, I mean, they're largely backing up kind of what we're seeing. You know, some of them concern hard authoritarianism, you know, being hauled into in front of the department head, in front of the, you know, faculty um, because somebody's made a complaint or, or it could be that a lot of it is to do with colleagues not wanting to reveal your political affiliation as a Republican, let's say, or as a conservative to your colleagues, or you, you're never going to get a, you know, a, a promotion or you're never going to. Get. So, so there's, there's a lot of that kind of testimony coming out of the conservative uh, you know, and, and you'll hear, so for example, the statistic that seven in 10 uh, conservative U.S. social science and humanities scholars report self-censorship and, and five in 10 of their British counterparts do. Um, I mean, that's quite interesting. One of the things that, and that's very much reflected in the testimonials. I mean, one thing that's interesting is to look at the uh, left-wing testimonials. So you have some of them, some of it is the kind of Israel Middle East stuff, uh, and on those issues, you can see that's where some leftists are getting caught in the in you know in the lack of free speech issue. But also, some of them say, "Well, I really want to be an activist, and and I want to be political in front of my students, and I can't." Yeah, yeah, and I, yeah. You know, so that's kind of interesting. It's like, uh, um, you know, I, I'm not being able to bring my whole self to work, almost, right? Uh, so, so that that was, I thought, quite interesting. Um, there were also you know, a smattering of other issues around, say, marketization. And, and, and that's, I think, is a part of this story as well, you know, keeping the consumer happy and, and so on. Uh, and then there are also perhaps issues around, um, you know, if, for example, you know, a university might have a joint venture with, I don't know, China or with some other country that's authoritarian and, and not, not, not wanting to be seen to complain about that or some kind of corporate influence. But yeah, generally, the on, on the, on the four, I, I saw a few on the Israeli uh, Palestinian question. Yes, yeah, yeah. From, from both sides, actually, you, you saw some is uh, uh, Israeli Israel supporters who said everyone's pro Palestinian. Some took the pro Palestinian side who, who were worried about outside the university uh, conservative monitoring groups uh, looking at that. Right. Were there any other? For, there were no. I mean, there was none on China in there, for example. I mean, I, I thought I saw one on on maybe it was corporate rather than Chinese, not wanting to criticize some industry like, and I, I, I can't for the life of me remember if it was a mining or something like that, but, but then you also had a whole slew of 
complaints, those who worked in kind of conservative religious colleges, but were on the left and, and were critical of, you know, so, so that, that exists as well. Uh, it's interesting just to see the full range, but of course in the data, I mean, it's very clearly the case that those on the left are much less likely to report uh, self-censoring uh, than those on the right. One of the other, by the way, interesting thing we see is that centrist academics in the United States are reporting quite high levels of self-censorship, sort of 35 percent um, saying that they self-censor. And now it's not 70 percent, but it's still much higher than, than the numbers we were getting on the left, which was something like 10, 15 uh, whereas in Britain, the centrists were more or less not reporting much self-censorship. And, and this could be consistent with the numbers I was getting for the ideological skew, which in Britain for social science humanities is about 9-1 um, liberal to conservative, whereas in, in the US it was 14-1. And maybe it's just that much, a little bit further down towards the left in the US and therefore people have to be that much more careful. Um, and there's probably more cancel culture activity as well. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's interesting because I mean, you came at this and you were probably thinking about, I'm sure you were thinking about conservatives being discriminated against and how much of that problem of a problem that was. And then you look at them and they're, you know, you imagine these people who got PhDs in some, you know, some university and they go, they the only job they can find is like some rural place and they go there and they find, oh my goodness, I'm being suppressed by, by my students who if, I, if I'm not a Trump supporter, you know, they're gonna, they're gonna hate me and give me bad right. reviews. Um, <laughs> That's that's a perspective. I mean, that's that, that's there. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure that I'm sure that happens. Um, <laughs> you know, I was just thinking, what, what are we what are we doing as a society to? I mean, these kids who don't apparently like college, they you know they're, pro they're probably rural Trump supporters and they probably hate college. And society tells them, you know, you'll be nothing unless you go to college. So they spend you know two years or four year uncomfortable years with these professors <laughs> who got degrees from maybe the East Coast or the West Coast coming to them, and nobody really wants to spend time together. And you know, we just we just do it because that's our system it's credentialism it's actually right. it's actually crazy to crazy to think about um yeah um so uh you know what what about you i mean you are a um you're 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 somebody who's known for taking you know controversial views i mean white shift in particular you said you know maybe some kind of positive white identity would not be the worst thing in the world considering our politics and may actually be able to diffuse tension that's not an that's not an easy position to take um do you do you feel discriminated against in your in your work life well i mean i think i may be one of these cases of somebody who either because of whatever i was interested in or it's hard to, to know exactly what was going on. I, you know, was I subconsciously self-censoring and not sort of really being, I, I know, upfront with, I don't know, maybe not. I was very empirical. So it's harder to, it's, you know, it's less likely that I was self-censoring, but there's no question that, you know, being established as a professor, you know, it's harder for people to get, get rid of you in a way and as you get older, you just get more bold in many ways. So I think that combination really meant that I was able just in the last few years to be a bit more out there in terms of my, uh, you know, what I see as, as, as sort of how it is, you know. So, so for example, on, the, on White Shift, very much that is a kind of a, 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 an early kind of coming out because, yeah, I'm basically saying, look, there is this... Um, you know, if we if we want to know about why the populist right is happening, why Brexit's happening, why Le Pen and Trump are happening, we have to understand that we're in a period of quite rapid ethnic shifting. And that doesn't matter to some people, but it really matters to other people. And actually, guess what? It's not because they're a bunch of nasty racists. I mean, there are a small number of nasty racists, but actually a lot of these people just don't like these kinds of changes. <laughs> and that's actually a valid position and you have to make an accommodation uh, between the people who want it slow and the people who want it fast and come to the middle. You can't just say to the people who want it slower, you're a deplorable bigot and, you know, come out of the dark ages because you're just going to piss them off. So that is sort of kind of the message for, and I'm not the only one to say that, you know, people like Jonathan Haidt and, and Karen Stenner and others are, are, you know, also more or less saying you're going to have to live with people for psych who for psychological reasons that are 50% heritable uh, and, and we've done experiment after experiment that shows this. Um, 
are not well disposed to the kinds of rapid kind of ethnic shifts that, that we're seeing in Western countries. But yeah. it's, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, that, that's, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, that's also, that's also an interesting uh, discussion. Um, the, um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it helps to be uncancelable when you're a little bit more, um, you're a little bit more empirical. I mean, it's, sometimes it seems sort of random. Mm. Like when they went after Stephen Pinker and they had that open letter. I, I was looking at it. It was, just, it was just, it was really funny. I mean, they could have got after me or or you. Um, you know, we were much worse. And sometimes they're, you know, they're intimidated by Pinker, who's who's a lot smarter than you know everyone who signed that who signed that letter. Um, and then sometimes it's just you know if you're, if you're empirical. I mean, there's a. It seems it just seems random because there are some of us who are who you know I'm not an academia now, but I was, and some of us are very outspoken, and nothing really happens to us. Us. And then some are like trying to bend over backwards to please these crazy people. And, you know, they're just getting yelled at. <laughs> they're just getting their classes <laughs> shut down. I mean, it's, it's actually, it's, it's funny how sort of random it is, but like, it, it's, uh, you know, did you see that? Um, uh, of course you saw that article in the New York times by, by Powell about uh, Smith college. I mean, this yes. Is, yeah. Know, yeah. I saw that. Of course. Yeah. Student who went to try to eat lunch in like an area that was restricted. Nobody was supposed to eat lunch there. And then, you know, Powell goes in and he interviews like the custodians and the janitors and everyone else who was involved. And, um, you know, they, they, uh, they were afraid to tell her, first of all, not to eat there because she was black. And then um, a janitor saw her and then the janitor like called security and, you know, she accused him of being racist and misgendering, right. misgendering her and like all these other things. And, you know, the, and the custodian workers uh, also got harassed and then the university, you know, put them on paid leave. I mean, I think I think the janitor went on paid leave, so he didn't even lose his job. He got he got a vacation actually out of it. But you know, a lot of a lot of harassment. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, it wasn't like objectively this janitor or that those custodians were were racist. It just happened to be. It's like a lightning bolt that strikes. Someone's trying yeah. to make you have these uh, entrepreneurs and they're looking, you know, these uh, victim entrepreneurs and they're looking for a reason. If you, and if you come across them, you'll be, you'll be a casualty. Um, and it's not right, right. that connected to how right wing or how quote unquote racist you are. Right. That there's just random. Oh, no, not at all. I mean, it's very much like the witch hunt phenomenon. Uh, and I talk about this in an article in American affairs, which I wrote called liberal fundamentalism, which is that if you take, left modernism as a secular religion uh it has you, you know it's more like protestantism and i suppose perhaps islam as well in the sense of having a decentered priesthood not a vatican style centralized organization and so with the with left modernism with this wokeness it's a very highly decentered itinerant preacher model where any one of these preachers can try and whip up a Twitter storm, uh, accuse a witch, if you like, get a, get this to go viral, gain the approval and the sense of power that comes from being virtuous and, and, and being recognized. And so it is, yeah, it's a sort of emergent authoritarianism that comes up from these itinerant preacher entrepreneurs. Uh, yeah, and they are... Now, of course, if they're a person of color, it's easier, but they don't have to be because most of the support base tends to be white liberals. So they well, they, they could simply they have to be something. I don't think you could be a cis heterosexual oh, white male. Oh, and, I think you could be. Oh, yeah, I think you can be. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, no, absolutely, Richard. I don't think you need to be a person of color. I really don't. To have something. Well, I don't. I didn't say person of color. You have to be gay, trans. Um, or, or yes, or something, or something like that, or, or a person of color, it, it, you know, to, uh, to lead a mob. Yeah. Anybody could lead a mob, but I'm saying to have the kind of, uh, the kind of entrepreneurship of that girl at Smith, right? Yeah. Okay. Why, but that's because it was out and all he has to do is say, uh, this person was mean to me and you ruin that person's life. That doesn't happen. That's just a pure identity thing. And right. might not even happen with a Hispanic or Asian. It, it would be easier, but it, it, for that, for, for, for to be that crazy, it would have to be a black person, right? And then there's just- Well, but, but, but no, I think, okay. So let's imagine that that uh, black woman went in and didn't say anything, but it was recorded by uh, a white liberal bystander who then got the kudos for popping that online, right? So it's, or, or snaps, does a screenshot of the tweet. You know, it's very common. You can get these white um, uh, 
uh, pastorpreneurs, to, to borrow a phrase from religious sociology, uh, who will, yeah, they can easily lead these, these things themselves as well and pile in. Uh, so, yeah, uh, probably if you're making a victim claim yourself, then yes, exactly. uh, you'd have to have some kind of oppression points. But I think if you, you know, a lot of the entrepreneurs are, are, are white cis liberal. Um, <laughs> but if that white cis liberal put that video up and then the black girl came later and said, no, you're misrepresenting it. I wasn't. That, that, that would trump. That would easily. It would trump. Yes, yeah, you, would it would trump. trump. You're right. So there's a whole kind of formula. There's a whole totem pole. And the totem pole has has race on the top. And of the race, probably, you know, black would probably be top of that pole. Uh, well, I don't. I mean, obviously, you've got, depending on a situation, sometimes indigenous is powerful. But whatever it is, you've got a, a pole. And then you kind of come. In the U.S., I, I've heard indigenous is elsewhere. It tends to be a really big deal here in the U.S., not so much. Yeah, it's there in the U.S. too, but maybe it's not as strong. Uh, Canada, the indigenous has all, a lot. All, of our, all our quote indigenous people. I mean, you look at them, and they, 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 they're not they're not distinguishable from their white classmates. So I think I think it's actually a little bit harder for them. Right, right. I think it's maybe harder. Yeah, in the U.S., particularly eastern uh, seaboard or 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 you know eastern part of the continent, it's probably harder. Um, Canada, it's, they're more distinctive. I would say there's more. There's less. There's a lot a lot of intermixing too, but it's not as. Uh, but but in any case, um, yeah. So these these phenomena of Twitter mobbing and this this whole thing, which is connected to that great awakening that, that Zach Goldberg talks about with the rise of social media, and so you get more entrepreneurialism. And and I because I have this theory that you know that actually if we were to go back to nine say nine the mid nineteen nineties. There were already incidents which I would consider to be um, cancel culture happening. Yeah, yeah, they, they were proto incidents, right? And yeah. you yeah. did not see a lot of resistance. I don't think you saw good arguments against them. Yes, people would make fun of political correctness, uh, but like the University of British Columbia, where I'm from, Vancouver, even they had in their political science department, they were totally paralyzed for months by these nondescript accusations of you know, racism, sexism, whatever, uh, they brought in like a high price consultant who kind of endorsed all of these accusations, but there was no actual target, any individual that they could point to. It was just some general culture, uh, but there was no actual, no one standing up to this um, academically. And, and it, so I think the difference is just that social media just makes it easier to whip these things up more often. But I don't think the idea structure is vastly different. Uh, some of the buzzwords around s safety and harm and whatever is is somewhat new, but the basic ideology is pretty similar, I would say. Yeah, I, I remember, I mean, I did a little bit of research on this. So the first speech codes and the first PC wars, I mean, they were really, uh, they really ca uh, came about in the 1990s. And a lot of time, what was actually the motivating, uh, what was motivating it was ra so-called racist incidents. Um, a lot of these, you know, racist incidents in universities are tend to be hoaxes. I mean, some people have done research on this. If, if you have, if you if you hear about a noose being found somewhere in a university, I mean, it's it's literally nine times out of ten, it won't be it will be unsolved, or if it is solved, it's usually a hoax. And I was looking at a lot <coughs> of cases, and they were, um, and they were, uh, you know, like somebody said a bad word to a black person, or someone did this, and they were never proven. They never, they almost never had uh, somebody you actually caught. Um, doing something bad, and then they would be um, they they would be um, used to sort of um, bureaucratize uh, this this social justice uh, worldview, and you know it goes hand in hand with the rise of administrators at universities. So I'm sure I'm sure you've seen the chart, which a lot of people have seen, where you look at like number of professors being hired from universities, and it's like flat or maybe rising a little bit, and then you look at the number of administrators, and it's just like a it's just like a very steep slope. It just it's just going through the roof, and they're taking and they're making money. And you know what does a diversity counselor do all day besides? find, um, you know, find problems with diversity. I mean, so we, it, there is a problem that we've created this bureaucratic class and th it's all done on taxpayer pay, pay or dime. I mean, there's, this is not like private organizations who are getting money um, from donations and then just like terrorizing people. <laughs> They're terrorizing us through uh, the money of the state, right? Either directly um, through, you know, government subsidizing the universities or indirectly through subsidizing uh, the law. Right. Uh, but but I, 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 I honestly, yeah, I mean, I agree. But at the same time, I think, you know, in the private foundations and businesses, you're seeing very similar things. 
I, I guess my, again, as usual, we're probably diverting, diverging a little bit in the sense I see these things as primarily culturally motivated and less structurally and, 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 and economically motivated. I mean, I, I guess in Britain, you know, where there's very much, you know, things are sort of more stringent and you don't have much of this bureaucracy. I mean, you have a bureaucracy, but you don't have the diversity of bureaucracy in anything like the way you have it in, in the U.S. And still, well, those, those, know, are this, those are U.S. colonies. I mean, those are yet mental U.S. colonies. So I would I would take anything. <laughs> right. Them. But the, the, but the, what I'm saying is the staff, the diversity staff, it's much smaller. Uh, they're not driving it. I mean, you want who's driving it? Like the student unions with, that are all radical and into this ideology, you've got um, radical academics who, who, who are well connected into those student unions, and then they're connected into their counterparts across all universities in the country. And then on Twitter, I've been uh, you know, at the receiving end multiple occasions of this network of, of, of real nut bars. And there's a sort of, there's a limited number of them that are very well organized and they live for this stuff and they kind of. Uh, completely riff off each other. So you've got, it's a bit like the trans uh, network. You've got these tight, well-organized networks um, that have permeation inside the university and off the university, and they organize a lot of this stuff. And so that that's, and that's kind of what, what gets them up in the morning. And, and so I think it's got its own momentum. Yeah, obviously, to some extent, they then institutionalize their stuff, like decolonizing the curriculum and uh, you know, race only scholarships, whatever it, it may be, they're pushing that in committee there and, and no one's going to stand up to it. So it goes through and then eventually they want to go down to the next thing and the next thing. So, yeah, they are making change, too, at the at the administrative level. But I think it's really coming. This energy is really coming from this sort of social movement uh, that's highly organized. Yeah, I mean, it's very intertwined. I mean, if you study revolutions, what, what generally happens is when these revolutions are inconsistent with human nature, um, it's hard to keep them going. And so people become cynical very, very quickly. So if you look at the Soviet Union, um, you know, the first generation is just, you know, really into communism. They're doing all these crazy things. Same with the, same with China, Mao Zedong, you know, Stalin, these were the revolutionaries. And they come and they, they really try to implement these crazy policies. Um, and then they, um, you know, everyone starves because it's, it's stupid and it doesn't work. And then just within, you know, the next generation, uh, people saw it didn't work and they, and they were a little bit more reasonable. They weren't selected for this group because they, so they went back to, you know, they would needed to be powerful states. So they needed to be reasonable and avoid war and they wanted economic growth. Uh, so by the time you get to like Brezhnev, uh, by the time you get to, um, you know, the Chinese leaders two decades later, they are, um, you know, they're, 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 they're much more mellow, but there's still people oh. in these states who, who believe in communism, but it, but it's, it, it, the, the, it keeps going. You know, by, by the time of the 80s, if you would have had a, you know, an election in Russia, um, I, don't, I don't know if, you know, the communists would have won, maybe, but the, you know, the sort of the, the fire was, the fire was not there. And I think with these, what, what happens here is you have the revolution and you have these true believers, but what gives it staying power, why human nature doesn't snap back is because of the institutionalization. Right. And you created opportunities and you've created a new incentive structure. So I, I agree with you. The ideas are there and they're they're important. Um, but, you know, the, the incentives matter and they matter a lot. And I, I, I don't think it's irrelevant that you have a full time staff committed to diversity. Like when you have the uh, you know, when you have a women's study, a lot of the um, the. Um, uh, not just women's studies, but uh, not actually women's studies, but the um, uh, the ethnic studies department, like African American and uh, Chicano studies. A lot of these were formed because of protests, because of absolutely, you know, yeah, that's right, in. that's their origin. And yeah, taking over a dean's office, and you know they don't want to kick them out, or they don't have the stomach for it, and they create these new departments, and they start giving them resources. Now, right. like even if nobody believe, if everyone stopped believing in African American studies as like a you know a great uh, uh, d discipline, the institutional pressure is still there. It's still it's still funded. Um, it's still just a department and departments tend not to just disappear. Um, so yeah, I mean, especially for people who want to fight against this stuff, I think what you can do, I mean, you can't always influence the universities, but what you can do is fight the institutional 
pressures. And that's something mm. you could do. And maybe it would take a longer term to, to change people. But, you know, if you look at like woke business, I mean, it, it took so long for business to become that woke. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, especially athletes, when I was a kid, nobody, athletes never talked about sports. It was considered crazy. I was talking with somebody from, uh, from uh, South Korea who was saying that if an actor talked about politics, people would be like, shut up. Like, why, why, why do you have an opinion on politics? <laughs> Right. right. And I, I think that's healthier than our, than our attitude where everyone feels, you know, they need to pontificate on on everything. Uh, but, you know, within these institutions, I think that I think that the incentive structure has been created and it goes back to government and anti-discrimination law. You know, it, it, you can't separate that from from true belief is what I'm saying. It's 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 a self-reinforcing cycle. And once you pull that um, you, you pull those incentives or you change those incentives, it's unpredictable. Maybe in the short term, nothing changes. But in the long term, you know, the the lay of the land changes and, and who knows what will happen then. Well, well, that's a, that's an interesting experiment is about to happen here in Britain with the government's uh, new uh, measures on academic freedom, which will be a good test of your argument because, and I think I know what's likely to happen, but, you know, so they're essentially going to audit universities to, uh, including the potential for fines to ensure that they're upholding their academic freedom obligations. And this will not just be talk, actually, which is the case in in, in some other jurisdictions, uh, such as Ontario and Canada, where they've got some of this, um, where universities had to adopt like a Chicago principles uh, statement. But that's, those states are happy to adopt those statements, but in order to give it, to make things change, um, you need to have these bureaucratic teeth. That's going to happen in Britain. And it's going to be interesting because it's then going to, change the incentives at the very top of the university, the fiscal and and financial incentives. Now, do I think that um, academics in committee are going to be pushing academic freedom, even though the incentive, and that's clearly where the incentives are gonna be. Well, no, I think they're gonna be resisting tooth and nail. Uh, The Equalities Act, those are gonna be reduced and it's gonna be made clear that those are gonna be less, that, that the academic freedom obligation takes precedence over the any equalities obligations when the two conflict. Now, you would have thought from a rational choice perspective, perspective, universities would go all in on academic freedom, given those incentives. Um, What I suspect is going to happen is they're going to be resisted tooth and nail, and they will only go in over the strenuous objections of uh, a lot of people in the university. And and I guess the reason I would say that is, you know, when the government introduced the equality stuff, the Title IX stuff, whatever, um, academics fell over themselves to over-implement all this stuff because it's what they believed in. And they actually used these acts like Title IX. They, in fact, over-interpreted them so that they could leverage them for their own agenda. And I think that's sort of telling me that this Legal stuff is not necessarily the driver. It is an enabler of ideas that already exist. And in the case of academic freedom, you can massively change the incentive structure, but the ideas you're fighting against are so much against you that you almost got to overrule that pressure in order to get change, I I would say. Yeah, I mean, I I want to talk about what the UK is doing. I think it's fascinating. I think we'll 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 save that to maybe maybe the second part of our uh, yeah uh, good our, idea. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, let me let me take a, a different uh, track now. So. Um, Somebody might ask, you know, what's what's wrong with discriminating? So I'll tell you a story. I was teaching a, a class on arms control once, and um, I was a TA, and, and the professor had a um, uh, a re- like a feminist reading on on, um, on uh, nuclear weapons, like a feminist interpretation of nuclear weapons, and it was it was right. just I thought it was ridiculous. Um, right. it was like it was like, well, the nuclear weapon is shaped in a way that sort of resembles, you know, what a missile. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> and, and, and like this was supposed to be some deep insight. And the professor, um, you know, uh, he, he set the reading list and I, I told the class, you know, this is, this is, I think this is stupid. Uh, I don't think this, this is like a good way to understand <laughs> nuclear weapons policy. And then the kids had to, you know, the kids, the, the students had to write an essay. Um, and then one, uh, one of them came to me and she said, um, uh, you know, I, I really like that feminist reading, you know, I'm going to write something about that, but like analyzing, you know, nuclear weapon policy through that. And I, I looked at it and I said, 
you know, there's no way I can, you know, I, I don't think that's a good idea. I just think it's a terrible way to understand these issues. And like, you know, I'm going to read it from, I'm going to read it from that perspective. Uh, and so she, she like went to the professor and complained and the professor just said, okay, you know, for her, I'll grade the paper. <laughs> right. Like, okay. okay. <laughs> no, you didn't get canceled. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, I mean, it was, yeah, I, I was really, I mean, I, I just, I was not gonna, you know, I was not gonna treat that as a serious no. yeah. kind of thing. I, I would, I would never sort of, uh, you know, uh, indicate any opinion one way or the other on, on these things yeah. because, uh, you know, but, but I, I think you're, you're, yeah, you're, I think there's, there's a, okay. Let, so let me, let me, let me, let me, let me just finish a little more of a more, maybe you're more liberal guy than me, but I, um, so yeah, I mean, she could come back and she could say this professor, um, this uh, TA, he discriminated against me. He discriminated against my ideas and she would be, she would be right. I mean, I, I did discriminate against those ideas, which I thought were not very good. So I, what, uh, you know, the fact that these, um, professors in your sample, the fact that they admit in many cases to discriminate, you know, if we had them and we talked to them and they were here, they would provide a moral justification for it. Um, mm, and they might say, absolutely. you are, especially <coughs> after January 6th, I mean, I'm glad we did this before January 6th, but they'll say, you know, <laughs> right. we told you so about Trump. He's, he doesn't believe in democracy and he tried to overturn the results of, a, of an election. So, uh, well, you know, how would you respond to that? How would you respond to the idea that, you know, it's just, it's just what's wrong with discriminating if people's ideas are bad? Yeah, I mean, there was quite an interesting paper which um, goes into the political philosophy of, of political discrimination. So essentially, you know, from a political philosophy point of view, um, political beliefs and religious beliefs cannot be distinguished. And even actually uh, race and gender identity as compared to say uh, religious and political belief are also more or less analytically the same in terms of that, you know, to a priori discriminate against somebody who has a particular political belief is to sort of devalue their speech and also to take a sort of one-dimensional, very caricatured view of what they think um, is, is likewise, again, you know, it is just pure discrimination to be like saying, you know, this person is, is Muslim or this person is an evangelical, therefore they must be stupid. I, I have discount what they say by a factor of 10. You know, it's essentially the same logic. And so, you have to judge uh, the work on its merits, um, and you know. So I think that's that is actually right. That you know, maybe this is a principle that is hard to learn, and isn't natural. It probably isn't natural for people to to take that purely neutral point of view. And it's it's one thing if the thing is badly written or or if it is you know. But I guess to the extent that the work summarizes an argument properly, shows you know, that they've subjected it to some criticism and looked at evidence and, and connected in a smart way. It shouldn't matter what the ideology, you know, I, I think it, I think it should, it should get a similar mark. Now, it'd be one thing if they said, you know, the earth is flat, I know, because I talked to some friends in the pub or, you know, yeah. something like that. Well, what if they, well, what if they said, I, I think the earth is flat and they made it sound plausible on its face, right? They, they're not they, because I talked to my friend at the pub. It's like I, I measured my, my front yard. I don't know, whatever, you know, whatever. <laughs> I, you know, well, also, yeah, maybe they have some sophisticated argument about, you know, uh, ca the categorical imperative and, and relativity. And I, I mean, I, yeah, it's certainly possible. They, <laughs> or, or what was that book that the, the, the world is flat? Um, Thomas um, Friedman. Or, uh, was, yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's his evidence. No, yeah, I don't think that was um, <laughs> So anyway, um, but yeah, no, so the, the, the political discrimination, I think that is going to become a major issue increasingly. And part of this is because of the tilt in professional organizations increasingly moving in that progressive direction. Um, this question of political discrimination will, at least for organizations where the content of your beliefs shows up in your work, that's obviously academia on the social science humanities side, but it could be the arts, could be media, could be tech, could be a number of these, could be lawyer, a law firm perhaps. Um, I just think that that whole discussion needs to get more prominence and needs to get more protections in a way, because I think right now it's seen as okay. It's, it's kind of by a lot of people seen as okay to, to, to discriminate. I mean, the other thing, of course, this, leads to is the loss of viewpoint diversity, which has a whole bunch of knock-on effects. So, you know, in the report, I talk a lot about how, 
you know, not just academics perceive, you know, conservative and gender critical academics are perceiving a hostile environment, but grad students, masters and PhD, um, conservatives perceive a hostile environment, perceive that academia is not really a place they're gonna fit well. Um, <clears throat> and that as a result, particularly, well, I found masters, uh, conservative masters students who, in their, who are in the social sciences and humanities are much less likely um, if they feel their beliefs don't, don't fit, which they're much more likely to do, they're much less likely therefore to enter academia. So you have this kind of feedback loop happening of a, a hostile environment for conservatives reproducing a hostile, a, a, a low viewpoint diversity, overwhelmingly left uh, ecosystem, which, which then is a hostile environment for conservatives. So how do you actually break out of that self-reproducing feedback um, is the big question. And, and so all the things we're talking about around hard authoritarianism, political discrimination, are coming together to produce this environment that repels diversity of thought from the academy and, and, and simply reproduces that bubble. Um, and so, and that actually matters for a whole host of reasons, not least of which I think, I mean, one of the big knock-on effects is polarization and lack of understanding um, there's no way that conversations that need to happen can happen across the political divide. Now, of course, there are other problems to do with just bad science. Uh, and I think, you know, Lee Jassim has talked about this uh, in terms of replication crisis and, you know, something like racial resentment scales, symbolic racism, all of these concepts which are simply nodded through because everybody agrees are never subjected to proper uh, empirical scrutiny. And so you get just bad yeah. knowledge going through. Yeah, I mean, I want to, I mean, I want to push back, I mean, a bit on this because I'm, uh, you know, I'm play, playing devil's advocate a little bit, but at the same time, I'm really, you know, I'm, I'm, qu I'm questioning the concept that, uh, about, you know, the whole idea of intellectual diversity and discrimination is wrong. I, I agree it's in some cases when, like in Lee Jussum, what he shows is sometimes he's right and they're wrong and he's seeing something that they, they don't uh, see. Uh, but is 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 intellectual diversity in principle? I mean, the, to me, this is the argument that the um, that the that the the craziest left wing people make at the universities. They'll say you have your Western medicine. Well, why not a diversity of thought? Why not this Native American ritual? And the principle can't just be diversity of thought is good because that's just you know that's a diverse way of thinking. But I don't think that's that's good medicine. Um, and you brought up so you brought up like the case of like discrimination against an evangelical Christian. So you know the, the you know the uh, analogy between political beliefs and religious beliefs. Now with religion, I think we we give people a pass. You know, we don't scrutinize it with the same um, with the same rigor we do other beliefs. So if you tell me, you know, you're Anglican or you're, you're Jewish or or whatever, um, you know, I'm, I might be an atheist and I might not think that's logical. But I don't really, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't press you on that. I, you know, I, I think that okay, this guy accepts some religion, and I sort of I sort of let him compart compartmentalize that. I say, okay, right. Eric, if you have a bad political idea, I'm going to debate you. If you have a bad social idea, I'm going to debate you. But your view of the divine, you know, whatever, you, the, 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 you know, and it's not logical. I mean, maybe I should attack it with the same, um, you know, with the same uh, rigor I attack your political idea. But but I don't do that and nobody does that. And what society would be unworkable if we did that. We'd be going around, you know, telling Muslims, you know, you're wrong or telling Christians, you're, you're right. And, you know, the society will work. <laughs> but um, to do that for politics, um, I think would, you know, th I, I, that can't be the right model, you know, to make that analogy. In po politics, well, you can't just say, I'm going to believe this irrational thing. Well, I'm a liberal, I'm a Trumpist. And even though it's under genetic control or whatever, it'd be okay. Yeah, the, these, these things are, but they still have to be subject to critique and they have to be subject to people saying, you know, that's just wrong. That's just an incorrect view. And, you know, if you want to be a professor and you want to have a, a view on political science, if you just have a, uh, a view that's wrong and there's not good reason for it, it doesn't matter if it's a political view, right? It's just, it's just a wrong idea. Well, I, I don't know. I don't think you can, I think you've got to assume that people can compartmentalize You've got to go on what they published, of course. I mean, you're still going to be hiring people who've got publications in good journals and and who are good lecturers and and so forth. But I so I guess I don't think their political beliefs are relevant to their qualification for the job. Is what I'm saying. And, and I think if they were really nuts, that would show up in their published work. 
Now, of course, and so I would be in favor of, um, yeah, I, I think political discrimination is wrong and shouldn't, shouldn't be on the table at all. So that would be kind of my, my approach to it. And, and I think on religion, I do think, for example, that, and I've seen there is some literature on this on, for example, prejudice against evangelical Christians, uh, that, that, that a lot of people would, there is a certain level of discrimination against somebody who's known to be an evangelical, let us say. Uh, I don't know if it would be the same for Mormons, but in any case, um, no, I think my position would be, you know, you can judge people on the quality of their work uh, using scientific standards and so on. And that should be enough. You, you don't need to kind of go into these labels and political beliefs and religious beliefs and, and, and start to sort of rule people out on those grounds. I think that would be a mistake. Um, and actually, I think this is going to be a bigger and bigger and bigger question because Partly of cancellation, people being canceled for what are essentially political ideological reasons. Um, so yeah, I think no, I, I think this is an important uh, principle. And there have been some court cases, incidentally, in in uh, Europe that have more or less uh, more or less outlawed political discrimination. So you can't just fire someone because they are a conservative or a leftist or a socialist or whatever. So that is seen as a, a, a belief system. Now, it's sort of touchy in law, whether, you know, how crazy a belief can be before it's, you know, if you, you think all the Jews should be burned, you know, then, you know, maybe you're, you're, you're no longer, it's no longer a belief that can be taken seriously. And so it's not protected. And, you know, there's that whole debate. Uh, but in general, I'd say within the broad parameters, um, I think it's a mistake to introduce that discrimination. Yeah, I think, I think, yeah, it depends on the field. I mean, if you say I'm going to discriminate against a Trump supporter and you're in an electrical engineering department, I agree that that makes, that makes little sense. Um, you should, I mean, you should, you shouldn't do that. That's, that's wrong. Cause you, you could be a Trump supporter or any kind of, even a Nazi or communist, I would say, if you, if you're, you know, an electrical engineering department, it, it, it's not even, it's not even relevant. Um, the, you know, if, but if you, let's say you're a philosophy department, right? I have a hard time, you know, saying that you shouldn't discriminate against Trump's work. If you think it's the worst, if you think Trumpism is the worst philosophy in the world, it's a terrible idea, right? Well, I, I, I don't know. I think it's, you could, all these arguments you could apply to Islam or Christianity. So, you I mean, in a way you, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, fine. I'll, many... I'll write that bullet. I'll say as a philosophy professor, you can discriminate against an evangelical Christian or a Muslim. If you think that it's ridiculous to, you know, from a philosophical perspective to believe in religion. Yeah. I'd, I'd allow that discrimination. I'd allow that kind of discrimination too. Well, but the problem then is if someone thinks it's ridiculous to be an atheist, you know, I, I, all I'm saying is if it, gets, <laughs> if it gets to a matter of just like, you know, whatever prejudices I have, I can, I can enact them. It's not clear why you would stop I, 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 that I believe religion. <laughs> I believe it for good reasons. I believe it's ridiculous to be a, uh, well, you know, whatever, uh, a Scientologist for, for good reasons. And, sure. I want to, and I want to discriminate against Scientologists, right? I mean, do, yeah, do that. I don't think you, I don't think you should be able to do it. I mean, it gets back to, I think it's one thing if you, if it's relevant to your firm or club or, and you're not dealing with the general public, I think you're allowed to discriminate. But I think if you are dealing with the public, then you cannot, I mean, that's the legal basis. And that's what I think should hold. I think essentially we make the laws and uh, people should be sticking to them. Uh, and I don't, you know, I think this would be a terrible idea. I mean, for example, I mean, yes, I think I mean, if you take philosophy, I mean, believing in Nietzsche and in Foucault, I mean, you could, you could easily claim that these are just as crazy well, as it's, believing it's in, in, in Muhammad. I, I, it's, it's <laughs> I and Rand, and you tried to get a, a job at a, a most American philosophy departments. I think they would discriminate against you, right? I, I think that I, we do yeah, we, I, we make those distinctions. Yeah, I, I think they should judge on the quality of the work, but and there's a lot of quality. That, that they'll say that's that's low quality. Everything that's Ian Randism, they will say, is yeah. low everything is evangel flat Earth, uh, flat Eartherism, uh, uh, young Earth creationism. Scientology, they, people would have these entire beliefs they don't take seriously, right? And they'll, and you'll say you're discriminating against, like, you know, you, that sounds like it's analogous to race or color of person's skin. And they'll say, no, I just like good ideas and I'm against bad ideas. And these are just bad ideas, you know, so whatever identity label you give to them. Yeah, I mean, I guess as, I mean, obviously there is, there are some parameters, there's some boundaries, you know, you need to have some standards, but I would be careful. Uh, 
as long as it's not, I mean, something like political attachment, Trump supporter, for example, you know, there's many, many different reasons and strands why somebody would be a Trump supporter. They may just be a Republican and they, they may just back the Republican Party and Trump happens to be the leader. So that's who they happen to vote for. I mean, and they may think he, I don't know, maybe for whatever reason, they may think he's more effective. I mean, you know, maybe he's because he's taking on the partisanship in the media or political correctness or whatever. So I don't think you can kind of typecast people in those one dimensional terms. I think it'd be different for somebody who this was reflected in their work and it was genuinely really insane stuff. So there are obviously boundaries to this principle, but uh, but the other thing too, is that, you know, there is a problem of, of everybody's bias. We all have our biases. Um, And the political diversity, well, diversity in general, um, you know, has its benefits. So, so for example, you know, the work on the wisdom of crowds principle, uh, it, it very much uh, conforms to this, that where you have more people guessing how many beans are in the jar, uh, you know, they're, 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 if you take their guesses and you divide by the number of people, uh, you're going to get a more accurate uh, guess, you know, that will tend to be as good as the best guess of, the, of any one individual as to how many beans are in the jar. Um, so, or similarly with a, with a marketplace, everyone with a different view on how much things are worth and therefore the market comes up with a better decision than any one individual. And I, so I think that whole kind of diversity of view, everyone has a different view has value, but of course, diversity on its own, there's an optimum level. It's not an end in itself. Yeah. I think think that's, I think that's right. I think your point about a Trump supporter, you can you could I mean, you could support Trump for a lot of reasons. You could have been uh, you and to make an assumption about why that person supported Trump. Oh, they just like they just like the racist comments. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. So there, there could be many yeah. different reasons, and and yeah, it would just be quite hazardous to go there. I think in terms of political discrimination. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to like to leave people alone on these things. I mean, we'll talk about these our philosophical agreements a little bit. Like, I, I think you know, businesses should have you know <laughs> right. rights and freedom of association. And I can like you or dislike you for any reason I like. I, I see that as sort of freedom association. You know, uh, we we don't have to get into these thorny issues of what's religion, what's yeah, what's, sure. politics, or or uh, uh, whatever. Um, yeah, the um, yeah, I, I think that I think that's right, and I, I and I think that this is sort of. This is an academic debate we're having because it's, uh, you know, I, I think what people talk about when they talk about cancel culture, they talk about this is people are being suppressed for ideas that are right or at least reasonable, right? Um, so, Lee, you know, look at someone like Lee Jessam's work, you know, he, he says, you know, that he brings some intellectual diversity. I don't know what he considers himself. If he considers himself a moderate or a conservative or a liberal, I'm, I'm not sure. But he's, he's obviously not as left as most uh, social psychologists. And so these social psychologists, they needed some diversity because they were in such a bubble in the sense that, you know, they were they were looking at data showing that stereotypes were accurate and saying, well, people are, you know, wrong and evil for believing uh, accurate things. And so he so it, it so it's easy in that case to say, you know, you guys needed more diversity. You guys were just in a bubble. And like any person with like a, a three-digit IQ could have, <laughs> could have seen through a lot of this who just wasn't who just wasn't taken in um by by the same ideology. So yeah, just outside the bubble. Sometimes though, um, and there was a response to uh the 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 uh the the paper with Haidt and others who wrote about um, discrimination. They the sometimes really homogenous groups can um you know do you know, uh, c- can influence the conversation in a way that's positive. So you'll see this um, criticism of like uh, the rationalist community and Scott Alexander. And I think these people are doing, you know, uh, very, they're thinking about things in a very interesting way. And right. if you bring in some thought patterns and some kind of ideologies, you know, if, 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 if like you took Scott Alexander and you said, okay, you need some intellectual diversity. Here's a, uh, you know, Sean Hannity. And like, you know, some, somewhere in between is, is the, is the, is the you know, will we'll benefit you. I don't know if he benefits from that. Right. Um, so these, so, yeah. So I think we're, you know, there's a target right now at the university um, where these people have an ideology that's just objectively wrong and incorrect and sort of crazy in some cases. And yeah, it's it's good to say, yeah, free speech and, you know, more diver, uh, intellectual diversity uh, with regards to that. 
I, I just have, I just struggle with it as, as a, as a principle. You know, I think it's very hard to, you know, well, is, is it just all, is it just all situational? Is it just that they happen to be, these people happen to be in diversity, but maybe not all of us need diversity. I mean, just, you know, any, any place you want to take that. Well, I, I think a first start, you know, a start would be not political non-discrimination plus political neutrality, not amongst the academics. They can obviously say whatever they want, they've got their free speech rights, but administratively, the official university positions, those I think should all be bound by uh, a code of political neutrality, ideological neutrality. In other words, you wouldn't be allowed as a university or even as a department to take a stance like to say, you know, Brexit is a, is a terrible idea or, you know, you would- Do they talk about Brexit? Do the British university uh, talk about Brexit? You will get, yeah, there are emails that go around the entire, all, all staff members that would be from the, uh, what's called the vice chancellor, like the president of the university, in some cases with avowedly political positions. I think a lot of the Black Lives Matter stuff, a lot of the equity and diversity stuff is political and also would need to be dialed back. Um, you know, so all of those sorts of things that would make the climate more hostile for I'm not, I'm not saying that you necessarily have to have a, a certain percentage of conservatives or centrists. What I am saying, however, is you need to at least make the environment one that is not hostile. You got to do whatever you can to limit the hostility, limit the discrimination. And then you'll probably get kind of like a natural level uh, of, of conservatives in there, just as you probably get a natural level of different ethnic groups, different religious groups. You know, I'm not in favor of quotas for those groups, which, of course, a lot of the diversity crowd, that's what they're pushing for. I mean, part of the, the thing here that is so incongruent and so hypocritical is the sort of push for diversity on some dimensions, but not on others. So very keen on race, gender, not really caring that much about class and, and income, and certainly actively hostile on, on the ideological diversity front. So, so I think it would be just useful to say, okay, come up with a single, you know, either you're pro, you care about representation and diversity, you don't, uh, but whatever you're going to do on one dimension, roll it out on the others. I, I think that would be a consistent position. And I would say, well, I think that professions are going to attract different people. We know that East Asians are going to be less interested in the humanities than they will be in, in business and in, in, I don't know, maybe medicine or the sciences. Fine. There's going to be a certain spread. Um, and, and, but on the other hand, you know, where possible, perhaps at, at the very least don't discriminate and, and don't make it any harder than it needs to be. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. I think calling them on their hypocrisy is, is a good idea and a, and a good strategy. You know, when they say we have, uh, uh, you know, they put out statements on Black Lives Matter, what they would think, what I think they would say is this is not a political idea. This is not like being a Democrat or a Republican. This is just standing up against racism and being a good human being. And this is, a, this is our value. And then someone else will want to say, no, that's a political view that, you know, this public institution has taken. And they'll say, no, this is just a, this is so, this is such a deep moral value. And this is a little bit of the game they're playing. They're taking something that's controversial in society that is, you know, was a, that's something some people believe. And they're saying, this is a, this is like a moral value that we all either we all share or that we all should share right and they're and they're but i think i would be i i might even be happy of a situation where they said well uh we don't endorse so that they would feel obligated to preface anything they said with uh, while not endorsing any particular political movements uh, we do endorse the principle that black people uh, are welcome because that would then indicate to people that that they are actually having to bite their tongue and, and that they are deliberately having to distance themselves from any particular political movement or extinction and rebellion or whatever it is to actually, they would be forced to distance themselves from explicitly endorsing a political position. I would like to see that at the very minimum. I mean, ideally I would like to see them not commenting on these matters and sticking to their brief, but if they have to, uh, it would be good if they would, have to really disavow any show that they are trying to be sensitive to the principle of political neutrality and acknowledging that there are different views and that the views that uh, are on the other end of, of or that oppose some of the movements that they are talking about are underrepresented in the university and they should really be trying to make an effort not to further drive those groups out of the university so that i i think that even would be enough of a signal <laughs> to, to people that, okay, 
they do care enough about ideological diversity that they don't want to completely go uh, go nuts and, and politic. Um, yeah, and uh, one thing I mean, one thing I think we you know we can we can talk about going back to the report is you make a distinction between the um, uh, you, you you have polling data from other uh, white collar professions, which I really like, just in the just in the UK. Um, right. Can you talk about the differences between academia and say, you know, what, what other professions you have, like teaching, hospitality, you, you have a lot of different things. It's very interesting for people to look at. Yeah, so, so academia, and particularly social science, humanity, academia comes out as the most kind of left wing. However, it's worth noting that, you know, particularly teaching and media, PR, a, a number of these other professions are also very left leaning. Um, if we, especially if we take the university educated workforce in those professions. Um, there is some difference of like 10, 20 points to between those professions and uh, academia. There's also a difference, by the way, between uh, technical college lecturing and lecturers and um, university professors and lecturers, you know, the, of, of a similar magnitude. So some of this is simply having a degree or an advanced degree, but uh, a significant part of it is goes beyond that. Um, one of the differences that you really see, though, that comes out is that um, when people are asked, you know, would a Brexit supporter be willing to voice their views to a co-worker? Uh, it's in the universities that that gap is like, you know, 50 points b b between those who would vo voice a remain remain in the European Union versus leave the European Union. You know, the gap between comfort levels in those two groups is like 50 to 60 points. In many of the other white collar professions, there is a gap, but it's more like maybe 20 up to 30 points, let's say in charities and hospitals and so on. Uh, and in some professions, like clearly in factories and so on, it's, it's essentially zero. Um, yeah. So and you can certainly see you have, you have testimonials. I like you have the testimonials from people in uh, 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 in these outside of academia. And some of them said, we just have a policy where we don't discuss politics. Now, I think this is sort of the beauty, I mean, the beauty of the private sector is that you'll get that sometimes. You'll get some places that just say we want non-discrimination. If some, you know, professions want to be a, have a lot of conservatives or a lot of liberals, you know, I think that's I think that's great. I think having a diversity of uh, institutions that people and professions that people can be a part of, um, I yeah. think is a, I think is a great thing. But yeah, the, the one thing you talk about is the, uh, acad the thing about academia is it's so overwhelming left wing. And right, it's, right. Yeah, 70, 75 percent. I mean, in the social sciences and humanities, scientists are, are less so. STEM is kind of, you know, well, STEM is much less far left, you know, by sort of 10, 20 points at least, even though it doesn't have very many more conservatives. It's got a lot fewer far left and it has more centrists um, in the sciences. But, you know, it's not night and day, though. There's still a, a left proclivity in the sciences, too. Yeah. And, you know, this and this is actually I don't know about the UK, but like, for example, white degree holders in the United States um, just 10 years ago, they were not they were not so left wing. Um, they were actually more right wing, more of them supported Romney uh, than Obama in, in 20 in 2012. And I think it's not an accident that as they've moved into become more Democrat, you've seen more of woke capitalism. You've seen uh, uh, sort of boardrooms now, you know, who's who's in boardrooms, college educated white people. And now instead of being, you know, majority Republican, they're, you know, 60, 65 percent Democrat. And it's amazing how fast this could change. And, you know, we should, you know, we, we should, uh, you know, I think I wish there was actually more research on why this is happening, because it's just such a big, obvious phenomenon. And it's it's recent. It's not a law of nature um, that no. people have to be have to be left wing. But but I, I think I suspect that if we were really to look at the data, I mean, the UK data kind of, I don't think this is a sort of representative sample. I mean, if we look at the more YouGov, that, that more representative data, which I do have in the report, which is from the YouGov profile set, which is like massive, it's like hundreds of thousands. So it's much, but, but I think what you see is that actually the professional workforces, workplaces are not actually that left. I mean, they are relative, somewhat left wing, but if you take the American National Election Survey, and you look at the partisanship of people with advanced degrees, masters and PhD in general. Yes, it's Democrat leaning, but it's not that. It may be now a 10, 15 point gap, if that. And so right. it's nothing like the kind of gaps that you're seeing in, you know, in these academic surveys. 
Yeah. And so although I, although I would yeah. guess if you looked at just young people, say, you know, 25 to 35 in the United States with uh, with college degrees or advanced degrees, especially especially women, I think you would find I think you'd find actually more of a more of a massive gap. So the trend is moving toward towards college educated people becoming more like the university, which they might not have been 20, 30 years ago. That that could be the case. I, I am not sure we know that yet. I mean, I, I mean, I'll just, you know, for example, I mean, if you take the exit polls in, in the 2020 election, you know, you could certainly see that white young people and white college educated were kind of close to the 50-50, you know, in terms of their voting. And if you look at the, I mean, the UK data there, age as a predictor of ideology amongst the non-academics, I don't believe, I, I have to go back to check this data, but I actually don't believe the age skew is that pronounced. I think it's there. So I'm not sure. I don't know. I think the jury is still out on how how left these professional organizations really are. I mean, but there's no question that woke capitalism has spread. Although I do note, I was reading, rereading Samuel Huntington's last book, Who Are We? 2004, and he was talking about um, already in the sort of 1990s, the employment equity agenda going into uh, DuPont and some of these corporations. And, and actually some of the, the, the early writers on the adversary, what Daniel Bell calls the adversary culture, even as early as the sort of 60s and 70s, were talking about the flow through of these bohemian values into the kind of professional middle class, so-called new class of knowledge workers was already a, something they were commenting on. So I think there's kind of always been a certain flow out of the university culture into the kind of professional knowledge class culture. It's just kind of, everything's just sort of intensifying. But this is something I, I, I hope to look at with the a new survey that I'm gonna be undertaking with. Yeah, and it might be, it might be just very, Simple explanation. It might be in 2012, the nominee was Romney, and in 2016, the nominee was Trump. And maybe if you had another Romney kind of, I mean, it could it just people seem to really react to whoever the face, especially in the United States, maybe there's not as much in other countries. Right. Whoever the face of the party just tends to have an oversized effect on sort of the American psyche. Although, although that Biden has sort of been a little bit less visible than than some of our more uh, more recent presidents. So yeah, we'll we'll see we'll see what the effect of we'll see what the effect of that is. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, Eric, you know, thank you. Um, you know, thank you for joining us. We just only scratched the surface of the report. Uh, like I said, there's uh, there's two uh, two hundred pages, uh, so you know, dozens and dozens of uh, of of figures. And so I encourage everybody to read it. It's called Academic Freedom in Crisis: Punishment, Political Discrimination, and Sense Self Censorship. You go to cspicenter.org, click on Reports, and and you'll find it there. Um, yeah, I encourage everyone to read it. And um, it's been great talking to you, Eric. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Richard. That was great.